um, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of what this uh, work was was a, a reaction to all that perfectionism that, that was going on. But, but a bigger part of what was going on for me was, I think, trying to work out my, uh, the shyness. And uh, I was painfully shy when I was young, and I probably still am. But um, trying to work out my shyness, and, and also just a fear of people that are particularly intimidating. Um, I might be 6'4", but I'm not tough. So, so it was just like, you know, I knew this project was going to put me in the situations where I'm going to have to deal with these people and have to kind of come out of my shell. So it took a lot of courage, but I, but I did it, and it, it ended up being a, you know, I think I grew a lot because of it, you know. Um, when I started this project, I remember I used to just get depressed and, and nervous and just like, why the hell am I doing this? It's just like, you know, I, I could stay here and just enjoy my life, but I'm going to hop on a plane, go across the country, go to some nowhere town and drive around, look for who knows who and, and confront them and try to get them to fight. The whole thing just seemed stupid to me. But I would just do it anyway. And in the end, you know, like uh, just five, six, seven years, in, it was like a seven or eight year project. I think of like five years into it, I got to a point where I could just go up to anybody. The Ku Klux Klan, Hell's Angels, uh, the most beautiful woman in New York City, I'll just walk up to them and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'd like to photograph you. I'm working on this project. It might turn out to be a book, blah, blah, blah. And they would always say yes, 100% of the time. I mean, it was rare. I can count on one hand how many times people said no. And it was amazing to me. Like, you would think like three out of four times people would tell you to go to hell. But I think if you really believe in what you're doing and, uh, and convey that, people end up, they feel it. And they can, there's a trust that's established. And then all of a sudden, you know, like, anything is possible. You know, the people ask me, like, what's it like to shoot some of these really, really creepy guys? They're like, you know, they're like pussycats once you get in front of a camera. Once they see this big camera and the, and the backdrop and the lighting and the whole thing, it's like, again, I think they feel honored. And they're just like, they change their demeanor altogether. There were so many times where we'd be driving around, with my assistant, and I'd be like, what the fuck are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Pardon my French. It was just like, we're, we're, you know, it's like, it's 75 and sunny in California. It's 28 and raining here. We're driving around South Dakota looking for... Who knows, some dipshit that, I don't know, we're, we don't even know who we're looking for. It's, it was like, the, at times, it seemed like the dumbest project I could ever come up with. And, I, you know, I made the mistake of, uh, of never telling anybody what I was doing. Or maybe it's not a mistake. It's the way I like to work. I mean, I, I don't, like, the only people that knew I was doing this project for seven or eight years was uh, my wife knew about it and my people at the studio, my, my immediate crew, my reps. Even my reps in New York and Chicago had no idea for eight years that I did this project. I just did it. And every time they'd... Call and say, where's Mark? Oh, he's, he's not here today. I have a cell phone, and they can call me, and I'd call them. I'd be in Mississippi, but I wouldn't tell them, and they'd think I'm taking the day off or something else. It doesn't matter. But uh, the truth was I'd be taking these trips. You know, I went to every state. I went to probably every state two or three times, and it was a lot of traveling and a lot of uh, clandestine little uh, you know, trips that no one knew about except for my immediate uh, people close to me. But you know, if I had shown this to people along the way, I might have gotten a little more... Uh, feedback and it might have been, oh, wow, this is really great, but I didn't want that. I think if you really believe in what you're doing, uh, you just do it. And I'd, I'd rather take a big risk and fail and die in flames than, than have these safety nets and kind of succeed. It, to me, it's much more exciting to just take the, the biggest risk you can and see if it works. Because to take, this, you know, take these little safety steps and make, make sure that you're doing something that's going to succeed, is, it takes the fun out of it for me. So I'd rather do it this way. It was more stressful, but, uh, but in the end, I don't regret it. Um, when I'm looking for, uh, basically like in terms of casting, when, I was, when I'm looking for people to photograph, I always tried to find people that uh, exemplified whatever the, the occupation or the culture or the, the region was that we were, we were looking for or what we were in. Like for example, if you're in, a, <clears throat> uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, you go into a bar, it's going to be full of auto workers. The, the room, you know, you'll have 30 auto workers in this bar, and you look around, but there'll be one or two guys maybe who really personify what an auto worker looks like. They, they wear the years of that kind of work on their faces and their hands and their bodies, and they just, man, that's, that's an auto worker. You can just look at it and know it. And those are the kind of people I'd approach. And those are the ones that uh, would always say to me, like, you came all the way from California just to photograph me? I think this is, the, I don't get it. You know, and then why'd you pick me? You know, why not this guy? Why not, the, you know, it's like the whole thing was very confusing to my subjects, but... But I knew what I was doing, and it worked out, you know, it was, it was a good way of working. Um, what was uh, very interesting about when we started showing these images is, uh, this is a picture from the first Fahey Klein show. Um, 
you know, there's a couple famous people in this collection. There's uh, Jerry Leininger, who's a U.S. astronaut that uh, went up to the, meet the Russians in the Mir space station. There's Letitia Baldridge, who was Jackie Kennedy's press secretary for a while. There's uh, um, Vito Antofermo, who's a middleweight uh, boxing champion of the world. So there's a couple, you know, semi-famous people, but for the most part, these are all unknown people. But when you start selling prints, you have these like really wealthy and famous sometimes collectors buying these prints of nobodies, which, which if you think of, I mean, every day there's millions and millions of people buying, of, of unknown people buying, you know, the masses buying magazines of pictures of celebrities. That goes on constantly. But here you had celebrities buying photographs of unknown people <laughs> and hanging them on their walls. And it was just like so weird to me. I mean, you know, Tom Ford, the dress designer, has like a five foot diptych of this, of one of these, not, uh, I forget which image, but one of these in his living room. And it's just like, that's just twisted, you know. <laughs> and even, you know, I think uh, Elton John, who's a big collector of photography, was uh, one of the first buyers of my work. And he bought a whole bunch of them, of the diptychs. And uh, I just remember, like, man, if the people that are in these prints, in these photographs, knew that Elton John was buying prints of them, their, their heads would explode. It was, just, <laughs> it was just such a warped thing that was going on. But, but it's, it's fun. I, I like it.